so this afternoon, it's, it's a, um, a real pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Michael Echerul, who is the William Sapphire Professor of Modern Letters at the English Department in Syracuse University, in New York. He comes originally from Okegwe and was educated at the University of Ibadan, where his contemporaries um, actually included the, the great uh, poet uh, Christopher Okigbo, uh, who was uh, tragically killed in the Biafra War. Um, Professor Achiro uh, earned, uh, earned his PhD from Cornell University and has taught at the University of Ibadan and at several universities in the U.S. Um, his publications are numerous and very varied and very interesting. Uh, he's published uh, three volumes of poetry, as well as a dictionary of the Igbo language. He's also an editor of Shakespeare and author of books on Joyce Carey, on cultural stereotyping, and on 19th century Lagos. And he's also published numerous articles and essays, uh, especially on issues relating to uh, literature in Africa. So it's a great pleasure to welcome him here this afternoon to the conference. And the title of his talk is Morning Biafra. Thank you very much. I want to begin by thanking uh, Patrick for being here. Patrick O'Malley. Father Patrick O'Malley. Um, we go back um, several years, and uh, I surprised him yesterday when I mentioned to him that when I met him in Malawi, I had least suspected he was the Reverend Father I had known earlier on, because uh, it was an experience I valued greatly, because it was after the war, and uh, um, but uh, uh, Malawi wasn't in the best of shapes in, in, in terms, and yet there was this struggle to uh, to have a voice. And there were very young people who were not in war situation, but who were in danger, in great danger under the tyranny of uh, Hastings Bander. And uh, looking back on it, I think we should give uh, Father Mali give him give him a hand because he did a great thing there. <laughs> It wasn't only that he promoted literature, uh, it was that he saved lives as well. Saved lives. Okay. Uh, my subject is Morning Biafra, and I had, should have taken uh, Fiona's advice to get a PowerPoint and do things, because what's happened is that being here for the last two days has disorganized my thinking. <laughs> and uh, I think more now that the great novel of the Biafra War should come from Ireland. <laughs> I have three pictures to, well, four actually, to circulate. I had hoped, uh, I had thought it would be possible. Um, yes. These are paintings by my late younger brother. He died in the Nigeria Civil War. He was a painter, he was an undergraduate at the university, and he had these uh, very haunting pictures which he painted of the Biafra. Um, I'll talk about them if I may. But meantime, I just want to uh, uh, do this and refer back to this map. This is the Biafra sign, and you'll find references in the literature to the rising sun, and it's to this image. What you will not find in those titles of novels and other things was the image around the rising sun. Because these three colors, as I'm sure we all realize, were the colors of African liberation struggle. So it wasn't only that Biafra thought of itself as a rising sun. It's also that it thought it was recapturing what Nigeria had lost out on. That when Nigeria became independent, it took the white, the, the green, white, green flag, which was nondescript in the African imagination. Biafra recaptured that imagination. It, it appropriated it for Nigeria and had the rising sun emblazoned over it. It was called the rising sun, but we, we used to call it the daggers of the morning. Uh, this, these were the daggers of the morning. Uh, it, was, it was an image. Uh, I'll be very incoherent in my discussion because there are many soldiers who would not go to war without this patch. To die without the patch was to have died for nothing. And these were not in ready supply because there wasn't an army that was equipped to provide them in the first place. So you had volunteers 
making these badges for soldiers who are willing to go to war but needed the patch to go to war. Um, grow misteried. I should also say that uh, my title is Morning Biafra, but there is a coda to that. It's called Tongue Tied. And uh, while I was coming to Ireland, I thought, well, they have a, a tradition of the wake, and they know how to make their wakes rowdy. But Biafra, um, Nigeria, has had no opportunity to, to bury Biafra. They haven't mourned Biafra. Biafra is still the ghost. Nobody wants to talk about it. Those who are participants in it on the Nigerian side are afraid to talk about it. Uh, they don't want the guilt to be associated with what they've done. Those on the Nigerian, on the Biafran side, some of them, the leaders, Ujuku, for example, will talk about them, but in heroic terms. But because of the failure of Biafra, they do not want to remember Biafra as a victorious event. They failed, as far as they can see. So they are not talking about it in those grand historic terms. The heroism of the war is not reflected in anything they've done. Those who fought in the war, and I'm talking about the volunteers, the librarians, the university students, and so forth, don't want to talk about it because, as they say, you don't talk a lot about who killed my, your father during the funeral because you may well be buried with your father at that funeral. <laughs> you, you take your time first. So they don't want to talk about that either. So the, the history of that war is being told in the history books written outside of Nigeria in the reports of the journalists and the reports of the activists on both sides who saw what happened. And it's become almost unfashionable to sing gloriously of that war on, on the inside. So in 1971, on the eve, uh, on the morning of the anniversary of uh, the victory, I was then at the University of Nigeria and Suka. We had returned to the university defeated. And so the, uh, this is from a small collection of poems I did, the saddened people's music makers, uncheered, unheard, who while on saw the sharp tongues of the sun, my God, in golden splendor, fall at noon, back to the edge of the world in the east on mourned. And, and, and so here we were celebrating the return to Nigeria and the bands were playing and then there were the the saddened music makers and their republic fell back to the edge of the world in the east on mourned and there they were, they had no wake for it. And so the question for most of the writers, including Chino Achebe, was what, what was it? What, you may think of Yeats, uh, what is the half pence to the pence? Romantic Ireland is gone. It's over. The delirium of the brave. What's all this talk? So the remembrance of Biafra has been deferred. Absolutely deferred. So one thinks of the Biafra event, I think of the Biafra event, in two terms. Either it was the romance gone bad, or it was, as, another, as your poet would say, a terrible beauty born. As to the first, sometimes when I talk to my children about the war, I think I'm creating another romantic island. What is this Biafra you're talking about? People died. And if you weren't ready for war, why go into it? We bungled it, if you like. 
And for a long time, the literature about Biafra will be, uh, no, uh, will be literature about that exposition, that justification. Why did you fail? Why, why weren't you better prepared for war? And then on the other side, there will be the terrible beauty, because what Biafra created in the imagination of Nigerians and of those who were in Biafra was a precedent. A precedent. A people can still be powerful in mind and in action. And what that meant was that forever there is this ghost or this incubus, this idea that perhaps another Biafra will erupt. When, how, we don't know. The threat is still there. But it may not be the threat coming from the Igbo people or from the Easterners, so-called. So when we have riots in the north or movements in the north, people wonder, is this the beginning of another it won't be Biafra, it may not be Arewa, it may not be uh, uh, Odudua, what will it be? Some years ago there was a coup in what is western, midwestern Nigeria by Oka. He wasn't an Igbo man, but he, he attempted to overthrow the military government. Was this something else in the tradition of uh, Biafra? I think of this and I think of Freud. I think of mourning. I think of melancholia. I think of the elegiac. And although I'm not very fond of these uh, doctrinaire positions in a way, I can also realize the hostility that comes from melancholia. And if Freud is right that in mourning we need at some point to disengage ourselves from the object of our mourning and do so almost sometimes in a violent manner, that is the melancholia. And until we have done that physical separation, we never attain some peace. In many ways, uh, many of us are going through that first phase of melancholia, hitting ourselves hard, regretting it all. Why didn't we do this? Why didn't we do this or the other thing? The melancholia leads a great deal to passivity. And people don't want to talk about their war. They don't want to talk about a rebellion, if you like, that meant so much, but which they cannot now celebrate. It's hard. It's very hard. And on mourning, how do you mourn a father? My father died uh, some years ago, and I set up because I loved him. He made tremendous difference in my life. He was involved in Biafra. He was a patriot. The war was about to break up in the university town. He was on the security committee. He came and examined the place, their defenses and so forth. His first son, he didn't tell me. Had lunch in my place and went out. I didn't realize what was going on. I had to abandon the university and my house without a thing, without a pin. But that was him. That was his duty. So when he died, we set up a monument for him in his house in our house in front of his place. And my uncle came along and was mad. Why do you set up a concrete monument? Then you will never remember him. Paradox, yes. He says because if you have a monument, you will never forget him. Let him be, and you'll remember him. He'll be in your heart. But now he's always there. You always see him. He's, he's never gone. I don't know whether I ever forget that advice because I cannot now remove that monument. So in many ways, uh, after the war, I thought perhaps the great war of Biafra will be written by Chino Achebe. He'd been all over the place. He'd written two great novels. He'd written Things Fall Apart and he'd written Arrow of God. Who else in a better position to tell the story of Biafra but Chino Achebe? the epic thing. And then I read his novels again. 
and then things fall apart. No, there's no king, there's no cavalry confronting the colonial masters. There's only some crazy guy, one man. And the great moment in that novel, if you recall, is at the very end, when the colonial masters said, no, you can't hold this meeting. Why? Because the district commissioner says, you can't in my village. He rose, took his machete. And according to Achebe's novel, the world seemed to stand still, waiting for this half-naked man with a machete. The world stood still, waiting. But that's, that was the end, if you like, of colonialism, in a sense. The post-colonial colonial moment was born at that very moment. He died. His people wouldn't bury him. There was no mourning. There was no wake for a conqueror because he'd committed suicide. But his friend, Obierica, says he was a great man. and You killed him. Biafrans are still looking at those who killed Biafra. They have not mourned their republic, and they're still pointing fingers at those who, one way or the other, were complicit in the destruction of this idea, this good idea. Leave us alone. We'll make do with what we have in our circumstances. In Arrow of God, again, you will recall, the one who said no, Zezulu, Come be our representative, be our spokesman, be the representative of the crown under us. And Ezulu says, not on your life, not on your life. He stood for his God, for his God. Achebe says, a God that does as he says never lacks worshippers. Ezulu's God failed. And he ended up with a demented priest. And it took to the second revision, to the second edition of Arrow of God before Achebe said, maybe his people will forgive him. They will forgive him. Because they're all true to the church of the Christian missionaries. And did their harvest there. And have prospered ever since. So I didn't, I thought, even if Achebe tried to write it, he wouldn't write the great novel I'm looking for, with the great battles, the great confrontations, the international, all of it. He would. It's not in his style to. But I, had, I thought I was so sure he would do this. This was in 1975, and I wrote an article on him, and I mentioned that. And then he published his novel, Ant Hills of the Savannah. It wasn't Biafra. I was brought to my senses. But he brought something into that novel. It's Jericho. At the end of the novel, Chris confronts this police surgeon who's attempting a rape on, on this young woman at the end of the novel and says, I'm going to report you to the Inspector General of Police. And the police surgeon says to him, if you don't get out of here, I'll kick your head to Jericho. Jericho, why Jericho? It's the New Testament, or the Old Testament, if you like. It's St. Paul in parts, but it's also the Old Testament. It's the book of Joshua. And how did the surgeon know about it? From the translations that came of the book of Joshua. It is the place of perdition. It's genocide. Cursed be he that will rebuild the city. Everybody knew it in Iboland. It was the ultimate curse of genocide. The language of the translation is the language of genocide. And it struck me that this would be the language that would be used in that novel. So although it wasn't about Biafra, it was in some sense also about the experience of Biafra. And in that novel, Achebe talks about the exiles. The exiles will return. How does a people make amends for a lost history? The echoes are not of Biafra, but they are the elegiac echoes of somebody who had been there before. 
And so, from my own experience of other literatures, I was worried that perhaps the great novel of Biafra would be what they now call the history of war, or the pity of war, the suffering. And in another sense, maybe not the pity of war, thank God for the resilience of the human spirit that we were able to go through all this and still survive and still be human, that war did not destroy our humanity. Well, I don't want a, a history of that war that simply does that, because this was not like the civil wars they talk about. It's not like the American Civil War. It's not like the Irish Civil War. This is not like the Spanish Civil War. This is not some campaign in Italy. This is not Hemingway. This is not, it's not that at all. It's about surviving. It's an epic struggle to survive. The beauty of Biafra was that that war made it possible for me to survive. To survive. And so the novelists, the first novel that came out immediately after the war was uh, the Behind the Rising Sun. And the behind tells you it's the inside scoop. I was there, I know what happened. This is behind that rising sun. Look at what went on. And of course it's like where you do the, uh, where you prepare the sausages. It's never nice. And so behind the rising sun there's a lot of untidiness. Many died. Many died. Called them atrocities. Inside, that is to say, behind the rising sun. But who wrote it? Mezu was Nigeria's, Biafra's, excuse me, Biafra's representative in France. He coordinated all the activities we had between the Franco, in the French speaking areas. A true history will make behind the rising sun, a text within the text of the rationalizations we are all too careful to make when things have gone awry. This wedding ring was sent to me from Paris through Mezu because I got married during the war. It never got to me until after the war. I'm not trying to combine that duplicity with the duplicity of the novel. I'm, I'm saying that, in fact, my own memory of him and his conduct of the war leaves me confused about his commitment to that war. So. I'm not disputing any facts that may well appear in the novel. That's not the issue. The issue is the sense that the untidiness of war is an aberration. I also want to think of Sunset in Biafra. That's a war diary by Elie Madi. Elie Madi was Two years my senior at the university, he finished and went into the army, into the Nigerian army, but he dropped his title as captain because he knew he would be, he would have been summarily killed. He's, he doesn't think of himself as Igbo because he's from the river state, but as I say in, my le in one lecture, anybody who answers the word Elechi and Amadi and is not Igbo must be crazy. Patrick, was that first name again? The real first name is not Patrick, is it? Aha. Uh -huh. Are you Irish? <laughs> it's that kind of question, you know, you might ask Elichi uh, Amadi. But the war ended, and his novel is 73, but what Elichi was saying is, how did they survive? A very good friend of mine, a fellow, writer saw me at the end of the war in 1970. He said, how's uh, this guy? I said, oh, he's okay. And the other one, yes. Then he was a little stunned. He said, who died then? That's a friend. Who died? It would have been a different story 
perhaps the novels would have been streaming out if they had been more dead, if there had been massacres, and how sad it all was, how misguided it all was. They survived. Who died then? What's all this talk about people died? Vincent E.K., some of you may know, also wrote a novel with a son in it. It's Sunset at Dawn. It's like E.K. and those who know his other novels. He's not the grand operator. He's a lighter kind of writer. But what he was saying there is the sunset at dawn. Uh, many people may think, well, the sun has set, but it's the sunset at dawn. It's an aberration. It's, as I say, it's a miracle. A sad miracle. But I ended up in in the University of Nigeria of Ibadan as the editor of the uh, the uh, Longman Creative Writing Series. And what did I have on my hands? I had two very important novels. The one was I was the general editor. The one was The Last Duty by Isidore Kweho. And the other one was Yayi versus Yayi Violence. I had other things to do with, like Mtali, the Muriel at the Metropolitan, and some other things. But to have these two novels about the war uh, was an interesting uh, experience. And I was the general editor, and I, I, helped, I helped publish them. Iyayi is, of course, is a Marxist orientation, and it's talking about violence in the abstract. But Okweho converted this into a domestic scene. Um, I don't know, we are familiar perhaps with H.D., the, uh, the modernist poet and, and the revision of this. And, and so we can think of uh, the Trojan War. It's, it's a domestic war. We went to get our girl back. And that's what happened. And so we got stuck there for how many years? And so how sad. And all the great things that emerged from trying to get our girl back. And, but H.D. has her own take on it in that great poem, poetic series, Helen in Egypt. And so we're thinking, and, and that's what happens with, that's what happens with this Sopeho novel. So impotence becomes the motive. It's not exaggerated, uh, it's, made, it's not made uh, topological, perhaps, but it is there. I don't have time, so I'd want to go as far as soon as I can to the novel that seems to be making a difference now, and that is The Half of a Yellow Sun. But before I do that, let me go back to Frederick Forsyth. His Biafra, <coughs> his Biafra story was in 1969, okay? And there are people who read history backwards now and think that he, he was the beginning of... Uh, the great novels of, of, of Biafra. He wasn't. He was, in a sense, the, the day of the jackal that appeared in 71 that sent people thinking again. Those who hadn't known him said, ah, wasn't that the Fred Forsyth who was here? How could he have written that? And when they saw later on the Odessa files, ha ha. This fellow knew more about the intricacies and the intrigues of uh, public diplomacy. Maybe he'd been in the inside of things all along. And I had a secretary who endured the war with me because, as I said, endure because I saw all the reports, every military report, every withdrawal, every defeat, every failed attempt to bring arms into Uli. And the fellow who kept my files summarize these things was a man, young man called A.D. Eero. He worked with me throughout the war. From the first day I was the director of war information for Biafra to the day of our surrender. And he wrote three novels, 48 Guns, Toads of War, and uh, Siren the Night. He knew Fred Forsyth. We had to research Fred Forsyth. And uh, Toads of War is not unlike Dogs of War, if you can see the analogy. But what he did, there was, that he had to make his own peace. How he survived the war sane, I will never know. He wasn't much older. He, was, he wasn't an old man. He was about 25. But he wrote 
every draft of these stories. He's a very strong man. And what I hadn't realized was all along he was going to create this macabre scene of battles and grand assaults and so forth. And that was the way he wanted to remain sane. And remain sane because after the war, in the spirit of reconciliation, the administrator of Eastern Nigeria, Mukwabi Asika, a friend, personal friend of mine, on the Nigerian side, had ordered all of us back. And he said to me, can I have your former secretary go for me? And Eddie Iro was employed by Sika, and that's why we get Siren in the Night, the so-called reconciliation, rehabilitation, and so forth. And he had a distinguished career. He became the Director General of the Nigeria Radio Corporation of Nigeria the most distinguished director they ever had. As I say, Biafra and madness seem to go together. In the poems and the short stories, it's, everybody's crazy, everybody's almost mad. And madness is, uh, uh, is a trope, I would imagine, that one associates quite easily and quite understandably with, uh, with the experience of war. We didn't know what shell shock was until the war came in, and young 18-year-olds suddenly had artillery bursting on all sides of them, or young undergraduates, 20 years old, rushing to assault an advancing phalanx of the soldier to find there was a ferret car behind them, spraying them dead. They hadn't had that experience. There was none of that. And so lots of these people got shell shock. They were deranged, wandering the streets. The first signs of trouble in Biafra were these young people. Was, you saw them in the market. They looked healthy on the outside, but they were just wandering, dazed. The language changed because of them. Ati, short for artillery, was no longer for artillery. It's for people in shell shock. And there were generations of them. My late younger brother worked a long time with these people. So what I'm suggesting is that that madness has had to be corralled, we have to get out of it. And you were talking about the confession. Well, I don't know what, whether you've, I don't think you'd ever want to meet a, a therapist. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that the confessional I know of, it wasn't just that I went to confession, it was that I went to confession with my principal. My school principal was my confessor, and I was facing him directly. And I had the religious duty to confess my sins before him. I also had the assurance the theological assurance that he wasn't actually him. He wasn't listening to me. It was God I was talking to, you know, how it is. Okay, that's nobody in Biafra who was in Biafra wants to have a confessional. There is no room in that society for the confession, for talking it out, getting it all hang out. No way. They internalize it. I don't talk to my children about the war. They don't want to ask me too many questions about the war. I don't want to talk about the war. So there is the danger that this war will die. But you'll find, and yesterday we saw somebody whose name is Biafrana, one of the ladies who was up with us yesterday. Her father had named her after Biafra when she was born. And she was a little upset that she would be called that. But that's, that's the marker for her, for her father. There are many sons who go by the name in Igbo, it's called Ogwevi. That There may be war and people may die, but a just war never ruins, destroys a people. A people never disappear from the face of the earth on the basis of a just 
struggle for survival. There are so many of these young people, and when you call them up, what's your name? They say, I'm Ogeri. In him is incarnated the spirit of that struggle. That's the name his father gave him. He, he's so proud of it that he didn't survive. He wasn't there during the war, but when he was born, his father thought of him and said, in you is us back, Ogeri. That's him. Oh, yes, call my son. His name is Oguri. That's the name I call him. And there are all kinds of names that perpetuate this history. Please add, I don't have that much time. So let me go on to Adichie and the Yellow Sun. And what I want to say there is that this is the beginning of a trend which I'm sure will continue, and that is converting the war into a domestic event. Because in a sense, it was as we see, even in the stories we heard today, it's a story about families. About families. Young, uh, an, an elderly man, I don't know how old he is, but war may have uh, worn him down so much. The one we saw in the film, Anuli, yesterday, he lost his wife, he's lost his children. He was the only survivor. And how, for how long will he be a survivor? If he survives, he will die heartbroken. And there are many who died heartbroken. The families, the extinction of families is something, it's genocide in, in miniature, but that's something Biafrans have been living with. So the domestic side of things is important. But the domestic side has private peace, it's the joy of family, the meals together, the frolic. That part of it is not the war, it was denied in the war. Somebody asked, what was General, uh, uh, what was General F. Young doing when this family was all out? What were we all doing during the war? When my first son was born, I didn't even know. I was busy doing things and then rushed back to see how my wife was doing. And I said, no, she's giving birth. She's in the hospital. I rushed to the hospital to see her. It was a boy. And I was so ashamed of myself. But I had to leave in 15 minutes because I had a report for the radio station. And it was one of the most heartbreaking things I've ever had to do, to tell her, I'm sorry, I'll come back to talk to you later. I must be on the way now because that broadcast goes out at 1 p.m. But that's not the war. And if I told the story in public, I would be laughed out of this house. Who's, who's talking about those nice personal stories. But Half of a Yellow Sun has given us something else to think about, where you can bring the war in, in a domestic instance, and not trivialize it into a personal, private account. I don't know how many of you have had a chance to look at it, but it's worth reading. And it's a young man, a young lady who was born after the war. Curiously enough, her father, her parents, were the godparents of my twin boy and a girl who were born after the war. And so when I see that young person write this novel in domestic circumstances, I say there is still hope that the generation that didn't go through this experience personally could also come to feel what it was like in that war. She won the MacArthur Fellowship, the so-called Genius Award in the US, and I'm very proud she sent me the manuscript before it was published to read through. And for those of you who are interested, you may find that my hometown, as a base for refugees, is in the novel. And she did that for me. She just took my hometown and inserted it in one of so many refugee camps there might have been. It was a little gesture to us in the family. But I told her something was missing from her novel. It wasn't a yellow sun. 
It was a golden sun. It wasn't a yellow sun. It was the sun of gold. And that sun of gold comes not from this private stories, but from the larger heroism of a vision, a vision of what the world could be. And so, sadly, I don't see that novel of what Biafra was. And I think perhaps the novel should begin here in, in Ireland. I listened to that interview yesterday, interviewing the priests, the nuns, and so forth. And I asked myself, what is the subtext in those interviews? It is valor, it is sympathy, it is justice. And the images, the moments are only the evidence of that subtext. And so it's not the pathos of the bombing or the macerated body of the children that is the novel. It is the subtext of the novel. What does, what does, it, what does it epitomize? So, for me then, and I want to end this with some poems. My feeling about the war is reflected in a small volume of poems which I prepared. I call it Distanced. Um, I call it Distanced because this is, uh, Wordsworth talked about this poetry in uh, Tranquility, recollected in tranquility. This is war from a distance. I wrote only one poem during the war, just one poem. I couldn't write during the war. I have known beside the hearth the little ewe and the small kid by the bulging others, the fireside, listening to a mild wind watching the fires come and go, the wood cackle and shine. Now I do not know. Where will the ewe now go? Where are the kids? Do I now know the hurt from the fires that consume with this roaring wind in the air and the fires still, still coming, the wind fanning the embers to death? Oh, the little ones, oh, my lovely ones, let the gentle wind, let the others where ancestral fires burned be still, still feed warm o and caress. Else, what tempests, what greeds in this dear, oh, this dear ravaged land. Oh, it's the only poem I wrote in the war, and I called it their finest hour. The poems I've tried to write since then have been poems sometimes of defiance, of hope, and I play with the idea of my fatherland. After the war, we were all called in, we were all arrested, we were all interrogated. They knew I was the director of one formation, so I had some case to answer. I went through my period of interrogation. But I was back in Nigeria, and I wanted to be back with a bang, if you like. I wasn't going to be apologetic about returning to Nigeria. And so I use my poems, I use my fatherland, uh, sometimes I'm talking about Nigeria, other times I'm talking about the other fatherland I don't have anymore. So, people's men, tongue-tied wake men, heaving unheard, drums trumpets past my doorstep. I, first foster son, fatherland's Darling dancer, lover son, I pitied them, heart tied to silent tears, and silence, oh my God, an age before, grace, beauty, love, valor, and dirges shook us, free from the song, laughter, cheer, cries of wonder, from pipes and drums of these fatherland's music-making men. Earth's wide rims cheer us, cheer up in this morning light. 
I fear the flutes and drums, the sharp, proud march of soldiers in this morning's light. About me, these beautiful furs, where this gentle wind passes this festive morning, they reach sheer into the thin blue sky and rock and weep with a shout loud, sharp, proud march of these heroes. They wake now, the sudden people's music makers, uncheered, unheard, who, while I saw the sharp tongues of the sun golden my god in morning splendor, fall at noon back to the edge of the world in the east on moon. I arrived in Lagos and went up to the marina, and there on the marina is the statue of Shango. With chisels of marble I chiseled him, who holds light, God's light on Lagos. I made the fire he holds. Beneath this torchbearer's pedestal is the deep undermining sea. In his hand the torch and flames of his fabled thunderbolt. Pass on, pass on, my countrymen. This statue, the statue of the god of thunder, was sculpted by the great Igbo sculptor. Ben and one one stands facing the marina. Pass, pass on, pass on, my countrymen. Beneath this torchbearer's pedestal is the deep undermining sea. In his hand, the torch and flames of his thundered, of his fabled thunderbolt. Some day. Perhaps, I said in a poem to my son, you will hear my trumpet some awesome night above the shame of grave and trench on that same Ogo road. And you will be there, I know. Some died, many died. <laughs> that shall see no sons, no, no more mornings. Some live, many live that knew no mornings, knew no folly, no, no glory. Don't fear the daggers of morning. Don't fear this sunrise in the face. Chasing honor, we saw God, and many seeing died young with honor. Will they see God and die old? I ask of my countrymen. Exile, I do not sing beyond these smiles and tears of fatherland but only talk and weep each day at the golden sun's unsung delay beyond the hills. A move is underway now to record the memories, the recollections of the older people who were not themselves combatants in the war. It's the closest anybody can come in Nigeria to trying to document the war. It's a scary subject. When I was at the University of Ibadan, I was asked to join the famous historian, Professor Tamuno Tekena Tamuno, to write a history of the war. I declined because I said I have no access, or we were not provided access to the kinds of information I had to write the story of our own war. And so a four-volume 
account of the war has been written for the Nigerian side, I'm sad to say, by historians who had no access to the archival materials about the military formations, the instructions to the generals, and so forth. And that's, that's sad. But what I'm trying to do now is I'll be retiring at the end of uh, in December. Was to pull all those young men there were then. I had a reporter in every battalion in the Nigerian army. And I want them to come back and reconstruct that war. And not reconstruct it as fact, but reconstruct it as a tale. Thank you.